Someone said something beautiful and poetic to me recently. They said that music was the only universal language. My response? What about math? They agreed to do some reps with their multiplication tables if I did some research on what's the hottest in American music right now. You know I love a billboard moment. With attention spans at an alarmingly low rate, I decided to really listen to the words of the current billboard top 10. Think of it like if TRL had a podcast that came on after the show. Some of you smiled at the TRL reference. Some of you don't know what TRL is, but can use deductive reasoning to gather it's a cultural reference. And with research, maybe you too can be in on the joke. And the last chunk of you made fun of me for referencing it. To you, I say you got the space jam you deserved. Coming in at number 10 is Good Luck Babe by Chapel Roan. At first, I thought this song was smooth like butter. And the kind of song you would make air noises to in the same key rather than listening to and learning the words. It doesn't stop you from singing along, but you wouldn't pass a test of the lyrics. Well, these lyrics are deep. It's the story of a woman who's married to a man, but she can't stop thinking about a woman she had a secret affair with long ago from the projection of the singer. The whole song in a nutshell is like, good luck trying to forget about me. Try as you might, it ain't happening. Even the way she said, well, good luck, babe, is rooted in proof that the other woman will think about her always. It's peaked at number 10. Number nine is Beautiful Things by Benson Boone. Sure, maybe you know this song with a crazy build and then there's a cap cut edit over it, but there's a whole backstory before you get there. And before I get to the backstory, can I just say it almost feels sneaky listening to the full songs of songs that are TikTok famous. Like a second or third date with someone you're not supposed to be on a date with in a place where you gotta be quiet. You listen to it for the first time all the way through. Oh wow, your song is so long and there's so many lyrics. What? There's a whole break for your guitar? All I'm saying is give TikTok songs a chance. Well, I guess they are getting a chance. He's the, literally on the billboards. The song goes, this guy meets a perfect girl and he's getting very spiritual about it and basically begging God not to take her away. So they are capable. He has a Janis Joplin essence around him. At number eight is Teddy Swims with Lose Control. To me, Teddy Swims is like, where did you come from and never go away? The only way this song should be sang is at a cocktail party with a view and the moonlight directly in front of you and him singing it directly in your ear. You see it too. It also gives vamp, vampire. If vampires are real, this is what they're listening to on repeat for 700 years in a row and counting. Number seven, Please, Please, Please by Sabrina Carpenter. When I hear this song, it makes me want to be in the movie Grease. I don't think that's what she was aiming for. What she's trying to ask in this song is that the man she's seeing doesn't fumble the bag and embarrass her. Begging him not to embarrass her is not as bad as him actually embarrassing her. Think about that. That is the message, motherfucker. We have another TikTok song at number six. It's Too Sweet by Hosier. You know, take me to church. This song is a little dance he's doing where he's saying the gal who likes him is too cookie cutter and sweet for a bad boy like him. He drinks neat whiskey and black coffee and stays up till the sun rises. <sighs> you don't want nothing to do with a bad guy like him. Honestly, girl, if you're listening, it does kind of sound like this guy will derail things for you. From what he said about you, it looks like you have a great routine and there are nice things being said about your personality. Run. Actually, walk at a brisk but reasonable pace away from him. Yes, you may still bang him. Sabrina Carpenter is back with Espresso at number five, which is a song all about the chase. It's catchy, and without question, people will look back and say, that was the song of the summer. Second only to Not Like Us, which we will get to, obviously. You know what my little secret hope about Espresso is? Is that it was ghostwritten by a pretentious barista. Number five is Million Dollar Baby by Tommy Richmond. Anytime a guy 21 to 26 walks past me, I imagine that that's what's on repeat in his brain. I'm not gonna say much about the song because I don't really know the depths of it, 
But I will tell you a fun fact. Tommy Richmond, he's performed opera before. Million dollar windpipes. Number three is Not Like Us by Kendrick Lamar. Sometimes I get mad if I can hear people's music blasting as they're driving by and it wakes me or interrupts something I'm doing. But recently I was driving and listening to that song and I realized I too am a driver blasting my music, particularly this song because I don't think it's meant to be listened to any other way. Anyway, we're all just mirrors of each other. Post Malone and Morgan Wallen come in at number two with their duet, I Had Some Help. It's a hangover song. They got absolutely trashed the night before, but they're trying to also point fingers at the female main character in the story and say she helped facilitate in the drunkenness. The song has a real snitch vibe. It's my job to explain what that means, but I just can't. It has snitch energy. It's toxic and I don't like it. And at number one is a bar song. Tipsy by Shibuzi, which is a modern day spin on the song Tipsy by Jay Kwan with a country twist. I like Shibuzi. Remember, he's You Won't Smoke, I'm the Marble Man. Great song. And people love singing about getting drunk. They love singing about getting drunk in 2004, and they love singing about getting drunk 20 years later. Billboard Top 10, whoever you are, you pie in the sky decider. Keep up the good work. Welcome to the Rocky Rundown, where you get to learn a little bit about my week. Party God Squad, hello! Did you have a good week? I sure hope so. My week was great. I've just been basking in summer and hoping it never ends. That's why I'm buying extra plastic. I'm joking, I hate single-use plastic and global warming. Unpopular stance, I know. I saw an absolutely outrageous thing with my own two eyes. It might even be viral on TikTok by now somewhere because there is no way the driver didn't record this whole thing. And this driver had the jawline of an influencer. So for all I know, I could be heard in the background of this clip. I'll set the scene. Driving down a New York City one-way street and a car is diagonally blocking the road. I'm going nowhere fast and I have the patience of a saint on a cigarette break. So I don't mind stopping behind this guy and waiting for him to pull off. But this, this was no friendly exchange. What was happening is the driver is trying to park in the spot. Alternate parking in New York City will break a person's spirit in two. So when you find a good spot, you're fighting for your fucking life. The character outside the vehicle was holding the spot for someone else. But who? With only his meek body, a broom, and a prayer. And he was not giving up this spot. At this point, the driver has the wheel of the car pressed against his shin. Let's just call the man standing in the spot Tiny Tan Mr. Clean. The driver's not revving the engine or anything. A tactic I think would have ensured the spot for him. But he's gently taking his foot off the brake and almost letting the wheel nudge tiny tan Mr. Clean. Both men have their phones out and they're trying to record one another. Here's where I got involved. We're going on four minutes and neither psycho was budging. So I say, just let him park. You don't own the street. The car behind me yells, drive away, you stupid son of a bitch. And I say, he's not the problem. The guy in the street is the problem. And then he says to me, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to him. And I say, well, I'm talking to you. Then the driver moves the wheel a half of a centimeter on the guy's leg. I know, unreal. And then the guy goes full Leo in the Revenant. Starts screaming and saying, call the police, call the police. I've been hit, I've been hit. Someone give this man a statue. He is well aware of how litigious America is and he's wanting his slice of fake injury claim. I look at him unbothered as he screams to me, police, police. And I say, sir, I know you're faking. I'm watching everything. Then he stands upright and waves me off and completely cuts the charade out. Then the car behind me squeezes by and slips into the spot. For this, 
Tiny Tan Mr. Clean moves. Turns out Tiny Tan Mr. Clean was holding the spot for the guy behind me. That explains the alliance. The driver kept staring back at me like, can you believe this? And upon reflection, I think I was missing the signs of a meet cute in the making. Damn. When this happens, the driver in front of me has no choice but to drive off, and I follow suit. The four of us may not have a lot of memories together, but we'll always have that dysfunctional encounter. This week's Wild Night Story was submitted by Michael from Queens. Have you ever heard of the musical Les Mis? I've seen it once, and I know a man who's hungry steals bread because he's hungry, thus miserable. Then the bread is gone, so all the other people are miserable because they don't have bread to steal. So they sing loudly and miserably together. I ask, where are all the bread makers? Did you not comprehend the cries of the miserables? And think, this is my moment to be the hero. Or were you having a bit of a no-carb stint? The show should have been called The Town with the Laziest Bread Makers. This was a regional theater show, and Michael was in it with a whole cast of characters. There were equity actors, and they didn't talk to anyone who wasn't equity. Michael was in a group of eight New York hires, and then there were a group of local hires. Everyone stayed in their cliques. The group of eight was inseparable. People shit on cliques, and being purposefully exclusive is just plain rude. But we'd be dumb to say cliques don't happen and aren't natural. Our survival depended on being clicky. Plus, inside jokes are secret languages, get one. This story takes place the night before their end of summer final performance, and it was a matinee the next day. The eight of them decided to go out, but before that, they had a wine and cheese and Prosecco gathering for everybody in the company, with apparently a little bit of industry fakeness, oh, so nice to work with you, can't wait to work with you again type vibes with everybody. When the eight of them go out after this bougie event, Michael starts drinking tequila shots and beer, which, according to country music, is the only way to start the morning off right. Yeehaw, cowboy. It's a lethal mix. Plus, he hasn't drank beer in 10 years at this point. Look, one tequila shot while you're drinking beer is fine, and two won't kill you. But three, you're in for a world of hurt. And as the old Mexican proverb goes, one tequila, two tequila, three tequila, floor. Drinking beer is not the norm for Michael anyway, especially with all these other drink combos behind him. This was a guy who grew up stealing his mom's raspberry vodka and putting it in water bottles just to mix it with blueberry Gatorade. That's right. In his day, there were no vapes to have as a social crutch. Only Smirnoff vodka and dashboard confessional. Michael thinks beer tastes like the bottom of a bar mat. That may be true, but how do you know what the bottom of a bar mat tastes like, you dirty dog? The first bar they were at, he happened to drive the whole gang there. They proceeded to throw the drinks back and have a great time. But he left his car at the bar, obviously, babes. Which would later add to the inevitable tragedy that is the next morning, you know that. They go to another bar and continue to absolutely rage. That's okay. He's 23 and mixing everything with a solid plan to take an ibuprofen the next day. As the night progresses, so does his palate. He starts drinking espresso martinis with Baileys. When they told him to do character research for his role in Les Mis, I don't think this is what they had in mind. He says that drink gives you the same high as cocaine. Hey, different strokes. Now we have a fun group mess. All these people have to do a show at 2 p.m. tomorrow and have now started adding joints and edibles to the mix. They get back to the UMass Dartmouth dorms, which is where the housing for the actors was. This is a 200-room dormitory with only two rooms being occupied. How creepy is that? And this next part is said with no shade to the great state of Mass, I promise you. But something about Massachusetts seems haunted. I don't know, it's just so New England, it's like every building comes with its own ghost full of baggage. And you're coming back to that bitch on a substance level 10? Oof, I'm sorry. You might be wondering, eight people, only two rooms being occupied, what gives? They were four people to a room, even with all those empty rooms, still four people to a room, and it was in the woods. Then they keep drinking at the dorms. That's legend status when it comes to who's going to party the hardest, the back home drink. And with all great parties we know, 
there's a small price to pay to the party gods. That price was, you guessed it, his hangover the next day. Michael woke up like a bee, body a buzzin'. This was not an ibuprofen fix, a Gatorade fix, a coffee and a hit fix. As he said to me, there was no bacon, egg, and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup on our rolling his way out of this one. He was unwell. The show must go on, so he hits the stage and immediately is like, come on, Les Mis, speed it up. I believe that's also what I said when I watched it. The songs are important to the culture of musical theater, and I can respect that. But for my money, I like fun and happy musicals, or something with a sexy edge. I can sing about bread enough by my damn self. His costume was a lot. He's in a top hat, he's in a suit, microphone, stage makeup. He's paired up with a girl named Trisha, and something bad was about to happen. There's a village scene with a lot of jabber, and he is going to be sick. You know it. You know that uncontrollable feeling. Just the thought of it brings me back to all the hungover moments I've had around town where I, too, was dreaming a dream of being less miserable. 137th Street on a hot Sunday morning. I'll never forget you. He's shaking. He's going to be ill. He cannot believe he's on stage in front of all these people in a top hat about to yak. He looks at Trisha, and their characters are looking upstage to the audience so you can only see profiles. Then, keeping it in character, throughout the fog and lights, the orchestra is going nuts and he takes his top hat off and he pukes right into it. Then he ran off stage to his dresser, who's going to get him ready for the next scene, in less than two and a half minutes, by the way. Throughout the run of the show, the dresser would take his top hat off him, put it on her head while she helped him change everything else and get him right back on stage. Putting the top hat on her head was one less thing her hands needed to hold. As he's running off stage, he's trying to tell her, no, don't turn the top hat, but she can't hear him. So she turns the top hat about halfway and spills it backstage while people are running back and forth all through it, just in and out of it. The show's done with everything by 6 p.m. They all go back to the dorms for the last time, having survived the show. Just barely. The infamous eight actors have never all been in the same room together since this wild night turned day. And I'm calling right now for their reunion. Milky espresso martinis on me. If you have your own wild night story you'd like to share, you can email me at wildnightswithrocky at gmail.com. If you haven't done so already, please like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can follow me at Wild Nights with Rocky on TikTok and Instagram, at Wild Nights Pod on Twitter. Moving forward, if you would like to hear and see my highest thoughts, aka my most stoned thoughts of the week, you will in fact need to join my Patreon for $5 a month. Reminder, you can also join for $2 a month just to say, who loves you, babe? If you want to watch the show with your eyes, you can subscribe to me on YouTube. A big thank you and a future thank you to everyone who's written and everyone who will write a review when this episode is over. It really does make a difference. And until next time, stay wild.